Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second installment of my National Popular Vote Compact series. Today, we'll be talking about the myth about small states. And specifically, I want to address the first uh, segment from them that I cover. The source of their quote, Tara Ross, I cannot find her actual uh, documentation. It could be that it's been purged from the archives of the Delaware State Senate. Um, and I and if anybody has access to it, I would love for them to post the link to it down below. I'd be more than happy to peruse it. Um, but I don't think that they're necessarily taking her quotes out of context. But I do just like to read them just to be, make sure that it may, there might be something that they're clipping out that isn't there. And the same goes for the um, second quote that they use, which is from um, Congressman Bellman, Congressman or Senator Bellman. Rep, he represented uh, Oklahoma in the 1979. Uh, he was addressing the floor. I want I want to say it was the Senate, uh, but again, just a quick intro. Sorry, and a few caveats. So if I don't pull up the source or find the source relevant material to post a link to it, that is why. It's sometimes things just get purged from the internet and archived off offline. So thank you. Have a wonderful day, and let's get this started. Today, 48 states use the so-called winner-take-all law that awards all of a state's electoral votes to the candidate receiving the most popular votes inside each separate state. Some defenders of the current state-by-state winner-take-all method of awarding electoral votes claim that national popular vote would hurt the small states and that the current system ensures that candidates must, quote, reach out to all the states, unquote. Let's compare Tara Ross's rhetoric to actual facts concerning the least populous states. Why so yes, let's discuss her rhetoric. Let's figure out what's going on here. I honestly think that it is an issue of maybe she's not understanding or maybe you're willfully misrepresenting. I don't know. Honestly, I can't find her sources, your sources, so I can't provide the context. But to say the least, let's give you the benefit of the doubt that she is over-exaggerating. Let's see how you plan to present this in your clip. Populous states. Wyoming received no general election campaign events in 2012. Vermont, zero. North Dakota, zero. Alaska, zero. South Dakota, zero. Montana, zero. District of Columbia, zero. Delaware, zero. Rhode Island, zero. Hawaii, zero. Maine, zero. And Idaho, zero. These six safely Republican and six safely Democratic states are not ignored because they are small, but because they are one-party states in presidential elections. Because of existing state winner-take-all laws, candidates have no reason to campaign in any state where they are certain to win or certain to lose. So what you're saying is that you have an issue with the winner-take-all system that is currently used by the Electoral College. And when I say currently used by the Electoral College, what I mean by that is currently used by the states individually. There are two states that do not use the winner-take-all mentality, and I think that their model is probably the best model for using the Electoral College. The president, in my opinion, should not be elected by a popular vote of the people, because then you, have, you will have areas where people are going to move to make sure that their candidate is won. Candidates only pay attention to closely divided battleground states, with the result that only 12 states received any general election campaign events in 2012. The yes, I, th I think I see what your problem is here. It is the issue of winner-take-all. Your issue is not that the popular vote is not being upheld. What you're really having an issue with is states that use a winner-take-all mentality for their electoral votes. Okay. So what you're trying to do with this is to say that having a political strategy on how you're going to run your election should not be 
utilized at all. Because again, why would you want to? Why would you want to go challenge in a state where you're going to lose? Just a thought. Well, the political irrelevance of the twelve smallest states under the current system becomes especially clear if you notice that these states together have the same population, 12 million, as the closely divided battleground state of Ohio. The 12 small states together have 40 electoral votes, more than twice Ohio's 18. If defenders of the current system are correct, candidates would pay a lot of attention to these 12 small states with 40 electoral votes. However, Again, why not? Why should I go as a candidate to a state like Montana if I'm a Democrat? try to win that state, which is hard to believe. Now, if the polling data showed that it would be a battleground state, I would definitely go. But again, why go to a place where I know I'm either locked to win or I'm locked to lose? It just doesn't make strategy. Should I promote ads and things like that to speak to the people in those states? Sure, of course. But unless the polling data shows otherwise, why would I want to do that? So, Let's move on. Let's see what the next bit is about. However, the facts are that Ohio received 73 of the entire country's 253 general election campaign events in 2012, while the 12 smallest states received none. Well, now, Dr. Koza, again, I don't think you understand that the political irrelevance of these states is not the fact that they're small. It is the fact that they are entirely locked in their ways of voting. These states have predominantly been red or blue, depending on which state you're talking about, for so long that it doesn't matter who the candidate is, they will vote for the candidate that represents their party. If I am guaranteed at least, you know, just splitting the number down the middle, I'm not, I'm not assuming that it'll be an even 20-20 split, but let's say it's 20 for red, 20 for blue. If I'm a red candidate and I have guaranteed 20 votes out of these smaller states, but I can get an additional 18 votes out of this because I know I'm not going to win maybe but one or two of the other states, I might as well go for the eight, the additional 18 rather than an additional six or seven. I can't believe I have to explain political strategy to somebody that has a PhD. Uh-huh. Now let's look at the one small state among the 13 smallest states that receives any general election campaign attention. New Hampshire received 12 of the 253 campaign events because political clout comes from being a closely divided battleground state, not from being a small state. In a national popular vote for president, every vote would be equal. A vote in Wyoming would suddenly become as important as a vote in New Hampshire. If every vote were equal, each of the 12 smallest states would be likely to receive one general election campaign event instead of just one state receiving 12 events. Actually, Dr. Koza, no, I don't think it will create the distribution that you're trying to sell here. The point of the matter is, is you're still using the electoral college system the same way. The exact same way. The only difference is you're allocating it to be based upon the national popular vote. So... If the national popular vote is for president or presidential candidate X and everybody in the state in presidential votes for presidential candidate Y, you're not giving them the vote. You're not giving them the voice that you're saying. Because now all of their votes are going to the candidate they didn't choose for. Candidates don't have to run in those states now. They just be like, okay, well, if Montana signs this, and I I don't have to go to Montana because I'll win that state no matter what because they're they're going to do the popular vote compact. I don't have to do it. I can still key in on the battleground states. So why do you think this will create this distribution of campaign events for a general election? For an office that does not represent the people directly. The picture is the same if you look at the slightly more populous states. 22 of the 25 smallest states are one-party states in presidential elections. Only three are battleground states that receive any campaign events or significant campaign expenditures. Okay, 
So the smallest 25 states in here, including D.C. So literally just shy of half of the states that can... Just half of the states. Only three are battleground states. I wonder why that would be. Because maybe there are more electoral votes in the higher populous states, which means... You want to have as many of those be battleground states, which means you want to, I don't know, run your campaign through those states. I'm just, I'm just floored by the fact that he doesn't seem to think that this is the, that this is the, the reason. He's, his case is predicated on the fact that the president isn't voted by a popular vote and it should be. Show me where in the Constitution the president is represented, represented, representative of the people directly. Now, anecdotally, people are going to say, well, he, President Trump represents all of us because of what he does as head of state. True. But do you elect your head of state? No. As a matter of fact, um, this is going to be kind of splitting hairs here because in the UK and Canada, the prime minister is the head of government, not the head of state. The head of state is the queen. But as the head of government and the head of state, the president basically fills the role as the prime minister. Do you directly vote for your prime minister in the UK? No. So why should we vote be voting for a president directly. Do you vote for... Did you vote for your head of state? No, that's a hereditary monarchy that's been constitutionally adopted. So... Why would people outside of the U.S. care about who the president is and how he's elected? I've seen videos of people complaining about the elect, our electoral process here in the United States... Um, one of them was a um, French national who's living in the U.S. and feels that she should have a right to vote, even though she's not going for citizenship, at least at the time of the story. I'll dig it up and put it in the comment section. But honestly, I think that the whole point of the National Popular Vote Compact is missed on the fact that we don't need to direct elect every office. If that were the case, then we need to directly elect every federal judge out there. And every Supreme Court justice needs to be voted on, too. Why don't we start that movement? So let's move on to the next As clip. Former Oklahoma governor and senator and Nixon campaign director Harry Bellman said in a U.S. Senate speech. While the consideration of the Electoral College began, and I am a little embarrassed to admit this, I was convinced, as are many residents of smaller states, that the present system is a considerable advantage to less populous states, such as Oklahoma. As the deliberations proceeded, I came to the realization that the present electoral system does not give an advantage to the voters from the less populous states Rather, it works to the disadvantage of small state voters who are largely ignored in the general election for president. This whole situation would change if we go for a direct election and therefore make the voters of one state equally important with the voters of any other state. Senator Henry Belmont, 1979. I was thinking about pulling this clip out of here because I did briefly mention that I couldn't find the source. I know I've read the actual speech somewhere. For some reason, I can't seem to find it in the government archive sites, but I'm not going to refute the actual claims here by the quote. I think that Senator Bellman honestly believed what he wanted, what he was saying there. I just think that he's wrong, and I think that to use it in the way that he is to support your national popular vote is wrong. I think that the popular vote that he was talking about was literally abolishing the electoral college in general, not just, not just a little bit, but a, <clears throat> but actually abolishing the entire electoral college. Sorry about that. 
so that going forward, it is a national popular vote. The problem is, is you're using it to promote your idea of just morphing the Electoral College into a popularity contest that it shouldn't be. The point of the Electoral College is to make sure that each state is represented in how it wants to vote for the leader of that conglomeration. That is where we lose it. People don't realize is that the the Electoral College is the body that elects the president because it is the president represents the states, not the people. So let's move on from that. Kansas Senator Bob Dole, Republican nominee for vice president in 1976 and for president in 1996, said in a Senate speech, Many persons have the impression that the Electoral College benefits those persons living in small states. I feel that this is somewhat of a misconception. Were we to switch to a system of direct election, candidates will soon realize that all votes are important, and votes from small states carry the same importance as votes from large states. That, to me, is one of the major attractions of direct election. Each vote carries equal importance. Senator Bob Dole, 1979. Again, much of the same way you are conflating a direct election popular vote to a modified electoral volatility. Electoral College vote, popular vote. It does you a disservice, in my opinion, to do that. You're not providing an apples-to-apples comparison of what you're talking about. There is no direct evidence that that a popular vote, the way that you have designed it, because you, you realize that you can't undermine the Constitution, that we have the Electoral College in place, enshrined in the Constitution, and that you're going to have a hard time getting rid of it. It's it's a bit disingenuous to use these quotes, in my opinion. Now, if I were making the if I were in the re- reverse roles, I might just do the same thing. So I'm not I'm not trying to say I don't understand why they're using the quotes. I'm just saying that I don't agree with them to support their case about the small states, because again, you're comparing apples to oranges here with the direct with a direct vote from these senators to a modified electoral college vote. So let's move on to the next clip. The current state-by-state winner-take-all system actually shifts power from voters in the small and medium-sized states to voters in a handful of big states that happen to be closely divided battleground states. In 2012, 45% of the 253 campaign events and a similar fraction of campaign expenditures were in just two states, Ohio and Florida. Yes, this is true. The data that they're providing is true in their videos. The problem that we have, that I have with it, is that you're actually not talking about fixing the problem. You're only making it worse. You're You're only going to be making these smaller states even more irrelevant. And the reason why is because if a state, if this were being truly bipartisanly done in every state, the winner-take-all method is flawed for this type of national popular vote. What it should be down to is if we're going to keep the electoral system, it needs to be one based upon the votes of that particular group. Uh, For example, My state is always a blue state when it comes to the presidential election. We actually run a Republican-run Senate, or we uh, House and Senate here in our state for a while. Um, And that's because Seattle and Tacoma and Olympia and Everett had a large control of, have a large control of the overall population for the state when it comes to electoral college and congressional districts. But when it comes to running the state in the various districts that we have in here, the the representation changed. We would be more Republican. Does that mean that does that mean that our votes are not getting counted properly? No. But in the winner take all system, when it's based upon the popul the population of the state, we need to correct for that. I think every district should be vo- able to vote for their electoral vote. And then divide the state in half for the the um, senators. So, for example, 
in a state like mine, we have a unique geography. It's not an easy split 50-50. However, if you look at the way the population lays out on the state, it does kind of render out to be a 50-50 split by the Cascade Mountains. We could use that. And then the districts that are over in eastern Washington could be utilized as separate votes and would draw in candidates to come over. And the same for western Washington. Let's think about that. Florida. The fact that the small states are disadvantaged by the current state-by-state -state winner take all system has long been recognized by prominent officials from these states. In 1966, the Republican Attorney General of Delaware, David Buxton, led a group of 12 predominantly small states, including North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, Arkansas, Kansas, and Oklahoma, in suing New York, which was then a closely divided battleground state in the U.S. Supreme Court, in an unsuccessful effort to get the state-by-state winner-take-all statutes declared unconstitutional. The I'm glad you brought this up, because this is one thing where I think the Supreme Court has it right, is that it's not unconstitutional. The states are allowed to select their electors, per the Constitution, how they choose. What makes it unconstitutional? What makes it abhorrent to people that the winner-take-all is in place? I've stated my reasons why I dislike it. But I also understand that constitutionally, it's in place. It's how the states want to do it. That's how they're going to do it. You know, I don't see why changing it in the way that you want to change it is any different than what they're doing already. You're just manipulating the winner-take-all situation for what, you, for what would be a small victory. How about if you really want to change it, and I mean really change it, you hear me out. Think about how the electoral college system works. One vote for each representative and one vote for each senator, which is why you have a minimum of three in every state in the District of Columbia. So I don't know how all the states divide up their senatorial votes, but, you know, a clean split, you know, around half, where the halfway point of your population is. That's one district, the other district. And you entice the candidates to come in by letting those votes stand. It would take about two or three presidential cycles, in my opinion, for candidates to realize that they're going to have to go to more states. They're going to have to go in because each electoral vote now is up for grabs. That's what we need to do. That is where I think our overall problem is. We need to understand how how the civics of the matter works and by making propaganda videos like yours doesn't help people understand it doesn't help people to truly understand what is going on with their electoral system politics is a messy subject people don't like to talk about it all the time because they get attacked for their beliefs from both sides and if we can't have regular common discourse with this, then why bother? Let's just leave it the way it is. That's how most people are going to see this issue. I, however, on the other hand, like to talk about politics. I like to talk about these types of topics. And I think that the National Popular Vote Compact is going to be just as flawed as the current winner-take-all system that it's trying to replace. How about we have a system where instead of trying to do it through the Supreme Court through lawsuits, instead of trying to subvert the Constitution through a national compact, let's try and change it to where each electoral vote is up for grabs on its own merit. Yes, that will be annoying. Yes, that will suck. But it could be an amendment that could actually get through. Rather than having a national popular vote, a national popular vote will not get through the states. We all know this. But how about we take it away from a winner-take-all institution to a each individual electoral vote matters? Then that way each group of people where they live can vote for their electoral vote and therefore 
vote for the president and their vote would count. Because what you're doing there is you're directly electing that voter to vote for the candidate based upon your community's vote. It's not direct representation. It's not a direct vote for the president, but it's one step closer and I, in my opinion, would be better for the country. So with that, I'm going to end it here. There's a little bit more of the video, and I really hope you do go and watch their videos. Because honestly, their information, albeit flawed in my opinion, is great for helping you understand where they're coming from. Watch their videos. Comment on their videos. And see what you think. See what, see what you think about their ideas. This is... Like I said, I'm not trying to change your opinions on it. I'm just trying to get you to think about an alternative to what they're offering. So with that, thank you for watching. Have a great day. Enjoy your weekend. And keep an eye out for the next video in this, install in this series.